then go to Dubai, and that was the vision many, many years ago, decades ago, to use Dubai as the centre, as the hub, to transform the, the Emirates, for starters, their economies, but also to see it as the centre of the world from an aviation point of view. Mm. Hindsight being hindsight with these long-haul aircraft now, mm. it was prescient, wasn't it? It was, and I, I, I think uh, in many respects we defined what the future was going to look like um, and the notion that you would create a super hub as we did with the tools that we now have, the, the ability to get from Dubai to just about anywhere on the planet with the 7878 we could probably reach Hawaii from Dubai in either direction, yes. you know, it has such amazing legs. So. It's a combination of that, and what it does, it meets the aspirations, the growing aspirations of the travelling public, not just in Australia, but everywhere we see this. People are on the move. Demand for air travel continues to grow at pace. The population of the planet is growing. And it's up to the governments in their various avi aviation policies to try and accommodate all of that. A lot of people are talking about the sustainability, about the uh, emissions. So SAF is the fuel. You flew in November last year, the first commercial flight that came into Australia using this particular mix of fuels. Are governments doing enough around the world to encourage airlines to use this fuel? Um, I, <laughs> I think they've gone a little bit too far in the sense that they, no, it's not encouraging. They're introducing what we call the mandate where they're saying you must, by such and such a point, uplift X percentage of your fuel requirements, otherwise you're in for a problem. This is not the way to do it. The, this stick approach, in my view, is not the way to get us across the line with regard to SAF. Today, the airline community, to a man, woman, call it what you like, would be using SAF if they could. We're equally concerned about the So why can't they use SAF? Because there isn't enough being produced. So why is, why is there not being enough produced? Because Because the investment needed to create refineries to do it or convert old refineries. The cost of the feedstock, or importantly the opportunity cost of the feedstock, in other words, if you extract feedstock from arable land which is put down for food production, you've got to be a little bit wary of that. So at the moment, the biomass feedstock, then you've got the cooking oils and all the other bits and pieces. This is all well and good, but the reality is that is it going to produce... Um, Today, 0.1% of the total production of aviation fuel is SAF, 0.1%. We've been given goals of 6%, 10%, and all the other bits and pieces. We would be the first to grab it. As you say, we demonstrated that we can fly the aeroplanes on stuff that's come out of cooking oil or whatever you like. Um, the scalability of what they're talking about is, remember, 550 million tonnes was, was consumed per annum prior to COVID by the aviation community. 0.1% is going nowhere. 10%, 55 million, but it continues to grow. Demand for travel continues to grow. So we need to, first of all, you know, face the reality of what we can do. Technology is moving at pace, particularly in power to liquid hydrogen and all the other bits and pieces. But when that, whether that's going to deliver this in the time scale that everybody aspires to, is a question of the science, the scalability and the investment that comes into it, both from governments and the private sector. If the two are at odds as to who puts the money in, there's going to be a difficulty in all of getting to where we need to be. And then, of course, the governments may say, well, not our problem. If you don't uplift 10% by such and such a point, we're going to fine you. We're going to fine the airports for not having the facilities to do it. We're going to fine the production companies for not producing the oil to fill the facilities that aren't there. And then eventually it comes full circle and it end up being paid for by the consumer. That's not the way to do it. The, the way to do it is really get to grips with it, invest in the things that we need to do to get some modicum of SAF in the sense, but really the future is determined by technology which looks at alternative means other than what we're doing. But if you're going power to liquid and you want to get hydrogen, the power that takes is enormous. So you can only do that through, you won't get through that through alternative sources, solar, wind, etc. You need to go into things like nuclear. And nuclear will give you modular nuclear energy, will give you the ability to not only power what you need for a, a country, but also give you the power to do all these um, power to liquid uh, transformations. But don't forget, if you. Hydrogen is not a mobile thing. If you're trying to get um, uh, hydrogen production plants into tertiary manufacturing areas like the Ruhr, you've got to be able to distribute it. And that therein lies issues with yes. regard to how you do that. 
or do you co-locate those, those manufacturing plants close to the sources of manufacturing or do you put them in where you might for instance get solar as well as nuclear producing what you need to do it. I don't know, all those things are out there but are we going to do it overnight? No. It's always good to chat to you and many thanks for your time today. You're welcome.